Good evening, Professor Mukhopadhyay. Welcome to Let's Talk Inclusion. And uh, our viewers, welcome back to Let's Talk Inclusion after a long time. Uh, I think a couple of months or so. Yes. It's our 36th episode today. My name is Manavina Chakraborty, founder uh, i for inclusion I can't tell you how honored and blessed I am today having one of the best known educational thinkers of our country as my guest in today's episode. He's Professor Mukhopadhyay. At present, Professor uh, Mukhopadhyay is the Director of uh, Educational Technology and Management Academy, ITMA, in New Delhi. He was a uh, joint director and director in charge of uh, NIEPA, chairman of NIOS, vice president of ICDE Oslo, member of the steering committee of International Multi-Channel Action Group on Education in Washington, D.C. He has been involved in uh, Indian educational policy making and uh, planning at the highest level since uh, 1986. He was chairman of the CAB subcommittee of the universalization of secondary education. He's the author of India's ambitious educational satellite, EDUSAT. Uh, Professor Mukhopadhyay has been a member of various uh, working committees on the education of the planning commission. Professor Mukhopadhyay has uh, authored, edited 31 books, if not more and hundreds of papers. He has produced and directed 30 documentaries and educational films. He is also the producer of the interactive video course on CCE. Uh, Professor Mukhopadhyay is an NRV, a non-resident villager, and anchors himself in his rural community, experimenting with uh, policy implementation and educational quality. His successful experiment in quality improvement in rural West Bengal was uh, flagged by the government of India in the HLG meeting in Brazil. His ICT intervention in Urang receives extensive coverage in Western media as well. I will not take any more time and come directly to Professor Marbar Mukhopadhyay now. Thank you very much, sir, for being our guest this evening. Thank you. In fact, <laughs> the big introduction makes one feel very uncomfortable because I don't know whether it's the same Mukhopada that you're talking and the person who is here today. If you see the photograph that is publicized in the your pamphlet, that's a different Mukhopada. <laughs> he had no <laughs> beard, no cap. Photograph is different, yes. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you very much for inviting to this I for Inclusion Forum. And I always say that inclusive education is my specialization in law. Because my wife specializes on that. So it's an in law. Legally, I'm expert, otherwise not. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, what does in Inclusion or inclusive education mean to you? That is exactly what I'm going to talk. Yes, sir. Well, my first, I'll lay down a framework within which I'll figure out what is inclusion and what is not inclusion. Yes, sir. First important point is that if we use a word inclusion, that means there is something called exclusion. So this is an antonym because of which we are using inclusion. We need to understand what is exclusion to understand inclusion. Similarly, for example, although words have changed from disability to special education to inclusive education, so it is something like we change our uh, you know, uh, suits and shirts, but actual person does not change. So my first impression is that it has changed the names a small history is important for all of you to understand because some of the historical characters I understand are sitting here. In 1985, when the policy preparation was on, it was mostly in the National Institute of Education Planning and Administration where I was a professor. And I was 
as you mentioned rightly, I was deeply involved. You know, one of the meeting, this question was raised about education of the disabled. That was the language at that time. And my executive director said, oh, they are very small population. Don't bother about it. So I said, no, if you talk of education for all, you are talking of education for everyone. If it is, one is excluded, then it's not education for all. And I told the committee that we are unfortunately disabled on the education of the disability. What you do is you go to the NCRT. There's a team there under the leadership of Dr. N.K. Jangira, who is unfortunately no more, a very good old friend. And that team comprised Professor Mrs. Mukhopadhyay, Dr. Janak Parma, and I'm forgetting the younger uh, member who is still in jo- on the job in NCRT. She is now heading that department. So that is why they started the work of inclusive education, what is known today. It dates back to 1985 when Dr. Jangira and his team had already started this work. Today, I sometimes I find com- uh, comments about people like them who created the history. Unpalatable comment because they don't know the history. Because those who make the history, they struggle much more than those who make use of the history. It's something like writing a history book and reading a history book. The effort is very different. I thought I'll put it to this platform, how Indian movement started with uh, Dr. Jangira, Dr. Sudesh, Dr. Janak Parma, and what you need to do is when you talk of ability, disability, and so on and so forth, we need to find a reference point and standard. What's the reference point? The reference point is the, is the concept of ability. I'll take, yeah, so this has reminded me, name is Onupam Ahuja. She is currently head of the department. I mean, that time she was a, almost a tiny girl like Manovina. She is now grown up. Uh, when you talk concept of ability, or I'll use the word ableness, this you will not find in the dictionary, you'll say it's a wrong word, but then after 75, I have the right to use any word I like, which is not there in the dictionary. I'll take two, three different parameters of ableness. First is the metaphysical. The metaphysical parameter is Om Purnam Purnam Idam Purnasya Purnam Udachate what it means is it is complete it's about god he's complete to the extent if you take complete out of complete what remains is complete is the concept from mathematics you can find is called infinity infinity minus infinity is infinity so the first metaphysical concept of ableness is completeness and then Indian literature talks about our recognition as Srinandubhisya Putraha. We are child of immortality. Now we could have been that we could have been deathless. And there's a book by one of the Christian saints. It's called The Death Habits. His contention is people develop the habit of dying, so they die, otherwise they don't need to die. And he said he has found 300-year-old people in the Himalayas. Similarly, if you read the Christian literature, when Adam and Eve were sent, they had all the divine power, but they disobeyed the God by eating the fruit of the central tea. It's an allegory. It has different meaning, but that is not the, this is not the right forum for that one. But fact is, everyone is born potentially complete. And the moment we are not complete, that means we are not, ableness does not fit in with any one of us. Now let us go to some of the contemporary theories because many people may find metaphysical theory very difficult. There's something called conceptual systems theory, which was proposed by Harvey, Hunt, and Schroeder. Conceptual systems theory is that People vary in their conceptual complexity. For example, when you look at people, some people are very good at managing one item at a time. 
some people can manage a very complex kind of a thing for example many of us like i specialize in two two areas of education education is broad based within that management is a small particle and education technology is a small particle whatever discipline we are not able to manage that discipline sometimes i am writing on education technology and next moment on education management so the kind of referencing that i am doing the kind of that's called conceptual complexity now people vary widely in conceptual complexity highest complexity is towards perfection low level complexity and if the teacher community present here do not mind global research is teachers have low conceptual complexity that's one of the reason why they are not able to manage learning of the students and if you look at james coleman's work jenks work tonton hussein's work sul's work schools have actually very little impact or effect on students learning outcome reason is that teachers have got that complexity deficiency conceptual complexity deficiency let us take another neuroscience i know uh, monobin has been working on neurodiversity but i am not getting into that area because i'll be caught in the neuroscience we look at brain neurons at the moment the excellent human performance is based on 11% utilization of brain neurons what would happen if it is 14% leave alone 100% the moment we look at the brain science the whole thing is pointing as how quickly you can form brain patterns by exciting the brain neurons creating synapses and creating brain patterns there's a beautiful book called seven day weekend by um, ricardo semlar by the title i thought it was written for the bengalis who look for weekend all the time but then i read one of in his exception <laughs> when i read i realized it was a very different kind of a concept his concept was that human longevity will be around 150 years 25 years later is going to the university and all that kind of stuff then you get into the job today many people tell me at 60 or 65 sir i have retired i said you have got into a problem now he said why i say you are not going to die before 90 what will you do for the next 25 years there's no structure in your life so long there is a time table or there is a in tray out tray in administration i call on the left side is the in tray where file comes we clear the file and put it on the right tray so my time is guided by my assistants and clerks and those people now we don't we have nobody now when you get into that kind of a situation of 150 years if you leave the last 20 years then your total work space increases to almost 90 years so his proposition is that people will work let us say as a as an advocate for 15 years then you say oh my god 15 years let me do some other course so she goes into medicine finishes medicine practices medicine for another 15 years then changes to another profession and his contention is that chances are that every human being will have four professions it has very important implication for neuroscience every time what you are doing we are doing based on our brain patterning brain wiring when i change from teaching to medicine medicine to say designing designing to something else my brain pattern is continually changing if you look at a beautiful book called the uh, Mozart and the uh, yeah, by he is saying that forgetting and dementia is not necessary. It depends upon Richard Rastak. He is a medical doctor and very uh, high order specialist in the world on on human brain. Mozart brain and the fighter pilot. So he is saying that the moment you do something which you have not done earlier, brain has to relearn. For example, I am a right hander. he says you start writing with the left hand so brain has to reconstruct itself you walk backward you walk sideways you do what you never did earlier you cook with left hand cook with right hand so that brain has to continually change itself 
Now, that indicates that enormous power of the brain which has remained unutilized. My third point is what we call uh, Martin Seligman, who is called the father of modern positive psychology. He brought in two concepts. One is called learned optimism. Another is called learned helplessness. Most of us, I mean, except high achievers, most of the people are victims of learned helplessness. I'll give you a small example. I'm an arthritic patient, so I used to go for my uh, physiotherapy to the hospital. One day I found the hospital floor was very dirty. So I asked the girl who was doing the physiotherapy, I said, what's the problem? He said, sir, sweeper has not come. I said, can you leave my hand for a few minutes? She left naturally. So I started picking up those things which are lying down. He says, sir, what are you doing? I said, instead of topping me, you also join hands. So all the physiotherapists joined hand and in about five minutes, the whole floor was absolutely clean. I asked her a question. What is it that a sweeper knows, but we don't know? There can be many things which we know sweepers don't know. Now, this is called learned helplessness. Because I'm educated, because I'm a professor, because I'm a physiotherapist, I can't clean the floor. <clears throat> this is exactly what has happened in the learned helplessness. That's a beautiful concept, which Carol Dweck took it further to call growth mindset and uh, fixed mindset. Growth mindset is basically we believe that my best is yet to come. Fixed mindset believes we have arrived. Now that would mean that the hidden potential is much larger than what we are all playing out. out. You are talking about my books. I think one of the world's most renowned psychologists had 50 books, 500 papers published in refereed research journals. And that was not his full-time job. He was a teacher. He had a hobby of gardening, hobby of cooking. So with all that, now imagine the kind of potential that we have, which we are not utilizing. Now, given this scenario, my first proposition is our concept of abledness is very underdeveloped. That's my first proposition. Second proposition, if you look at the whole concept of ability and disability is based on uh, five sense organs, Western world, and our limbs. Eastern philosophy is about 10 organs. Because other than nose, eyes, ear, etc., it adds hands as the carmendria. It adds legs as the chalandendria, organ of movement. And then uh, the reproductive organ, excretory organ, and the master organ, Indriya, is mind. You'll find this beautiful reference in Swamiji's, Swami Vivekananda's book called Raj Yoga, in which he talks about eyes do not see, eyes are powered by mind to see. If you watch carefully, particularly those who are teachers, for them it is very easy to understand. A large majority of students hear but not listen. True. Similarly, many of us, we see, but we don't observe. Now, the difference between see and observe is very important. Hearing and listening. Hearing is some noise is going around. Listening is when I'm contemplating. This is emerging a very interesting, uh, if some of you are interested, you can look at it called contemplative pedagogy. When you're listening to something, you are also contemplating within that. And that will generate a new dimension. You will not be replicating what you are talking about because the moment you go to the theory of subsumption or learning, you have got a stock already. And the moment a new information tries to enter your uh, cognitive construct, it's first like a Dwarpal, a gatekeeper, it protects. It wants to check up what is this new knowledge. It verifies the antecedent of the new knowledge. And if he finds it is compatible, it takes it. 
Similarly, we have seen in the brain a uh, beautiful waste, ma waste management mechanism of the brain. When it finds that you are not using something, it throws it away. Like, personally, I say that if, I, if you look at my degree, I am a science graduate. Today, if somebody asks me anything, I don't know anything at all. So that's called law of disuse. Coming back to this, so these five or ten sense organs and the power of mind, when the mind powers fully, one is able to listen. When the mind does not power fully, one is able to hear. Now, how do you handle the mind? Because that is the biggest thing. For example, one of the things that you must be knowing that people talk about helping is a very good art, very good empathic behavior is absolutely right. But helping beyond need is disabling. I remember one incident with my, because of my fingers, I was trying to find it difficult to put the paste onto my toothbrush. Somebody immediately came to help me, my sister, who is no more. He said, don't help him. Let him do it. If he doesn't, if he cannot do it, he will ask for help. And I could do it. But the moment I'm given all that, similarly, the worst disability is not able to take decision. The moment you don't allow people to take decision, which you find in the schools, colleges, at homes also, the first people, oh, no, no, you cannot do it. Now, the important point is you take the decision and allow them to suffer for the decision or rejoice the decision. Then they will learn from the suffering and rejoicing what is the right decision that builds ability. Now, given this, when we talk about the ability assessment metrics, we are looking at sense organ. I come to another domain and maybe I'll put a problem for Monobina for future. That is, when you look at a blind or who is, who is not able to see, have you noticed that his extrasensory perception of hearing, touch is much superior to you and me? Yeah. Yes. If a person is deaf, he is able to read the lips, but you and I cannot read the lips. That means in the brain there is some place where it is possible that they have got extra, extra uh, neuron excitement. If they have got, that means we also have got. I don't know whether you are familiar. There is a profession called tea tester. We talk about tongue and lot of test buds. But you cannot get a job of a tea tester. It's a very specific sensation of the test bud. And they never take tea. Now that means whatever you understand today is very inadequate. Can you figure out what is so special about the blind or deaf or a why they are so sensitive? I've also seen people who cannot doesn't know how to stand properly, cannot walk. I remember when we were very small, my father as a school teacher used to teach almost everything. So he was teaching how to walk. I still remember the toe walk versus heel walk. When you walk on heels, you are noisy, you are slow. When you walk on toe, you are fast and Quiet. We always had to run with my father because he will be always on two. Now the question is, we don't know how to walk. We don't know how to stand. Nowadays, there is very good things happening. Uh, girls are being taught to differentiate between bad touch and good touch. Now touch is touch, but then how to differentiate a touch? So there is a lot more things which are unexplored at the moment. Coming back to this. <clears throat> similarly, as I was talking about the mindset. Now the destructive mindset and constructive mindset. Both are expert mindset. But which one do we talk about? My Another very important question when people talk about this uh, Ability, disability, dichotomy, or a continuum. 
my question is those who are in the paralympics are they disabled more than people like us or they are more able than us we don't have that courage i'm sure most of you have uh, seen the movie bhag mil khabhag yes so who is able a paralympics i have seen a girl who doesn't have both the hands with legs she does everything including painting so the whole concept needs very serious verification <laughs> this compensating mechanism of that people whom we classify as partially disabled or disabled etc actually they are extraordinarily endowed with certain skills which we have also the potential but is not utilized similarly the other problem which i in my last two comments <clears throat> inclusion to me has emerged as an exclusive domain now i give you two examples uh in sndt women's university there was a program for the women managers it's an international program there are two or three uh women experts three women expert from england and canada one india and kamali mansali bhai shah was very fond of me so he says he said no no unko bula lo so i was invited along with those three experts and all the time i was listening chauvinistic male chauvinism and peaks and all that good stuff and they are very unhappy that i have been invited so after some time the hepty canadian asked me what's your view i said i'm sure you are talking of somebody else because i am so tiny then you can throw me out of the window any time you like but then the problem is when i came to the picture my session i asked them that can you survey all around to see how many male works for women development particularly in the rural and tribal domain area i'm not talking about the those who are talking from the rooftop of urban area about women development and then after some time the women doctor from sri lanka said well it's mostly men then came bangladesh mostly men and then there was a lady from delhi's vivekananda college principal she was smiling because she has taken my course she knows what mischief i am playing so the expert says you broke all the you know building that we brought, developed i said you developed castle of cards so it requires only one blow but most importantly in the evening professor armaiki desai who was former chairperson of ugc and a renowned scholar she was there in the dinner she made a beautiful statement she said men and women are not competing individuals they are complete complementing individuals he said when i got married i was not educated first my father in law says you don't have to do so much of work you must do study then my husband when i got children children said mummy we can take care of ourselves now he says every time there is a male member at the home who pushed a women member to excel he said this is not two categories it's a complementing category similarly when you talk about similarly i was present in a meeting taken by dr mr arjun singh he was then minister it was on muslim education and development the whole thing everything was going on sir hamare college ka our college grant our university grant and this and that i sent a small note because i was an official i said why don't you prepare a perspective plan of development of the muslim community he liked the idea he circulated that note to everybody everybody appreciated but nobody took it because muslims have been kept as an exclusive domain and i still remember an mp mr sahabuddin asked a very important question which i never forgot in my life he said sir when hindus ask for education you give schools when we ask for education you give us madrasas why and his statement i knew was based on a particular research which i had come to review it was a tracer study of muslim professionals in the world from indian i mean who have become doctor indian so on traced back most of them had very minimum madrasa education 
So those who had longer madras education, he missed out. This is exclusion. Similarly, when you talk about women's development, what is important is to include the men because only they can exclude women. Similarly, when you talk of exclusion or inclusion, what is important is to figure out those, the moment we are working with, I am working with the disabled, you are working very, you know, what we call one dimensional man. It's a book by uh, Robert Herbert Marcuse, but that concept is one dimensional thought. Thought should be everybody is either able or disabled. The question which Monobina uses is diversity of ability. She uses neurodiversity. I'm using a different word called diversity of ability. Now, unless inclusion is, you know, rescued from exclusion, at the moment inclusion is an absolute exclusive domain of domain. It needs to be rescued. It needs to be rescued so that everybody, I mean, you would go to social culture, I mean, castes, tribals, ethnic origin, all excluded people. So it has nothing to do with the ability or disability. My proposition, and that's my last statement, issue is not inclusion or exclusion. Issue is ability optimization. Whether they don't have the sight or hearing capability, or, or people like us, the so-called abled. So your challenge is how to do ability optimization. And that will be the real inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sure today's discussion has given our viewers a food for thought. Thanks a lot for this. And uh, sir, now we will go ahead and take some time for questions. Uh, our viewers have posted some questions for you. And it looks like I don't have... promise answer. <laughs> See, I'll tell you one thing. I always go for inauguration valediction so that nobody can question me. <laughs> okay. uh, so let me take the questions first. Let me see. Okay. Uh, the what first one is from Archana. What is the difference between inclusion and integration? I think Monomina knows it better. My answer would be, uh, uh, Madam Archana, if you look at physical mixture and chemical mixture. Now, inclusion is something, a physical mixture where you can separate out the, the components. Integration is the chemical mixture where you cannot do it. Because by integration, in chemical mixture, every item, every element has lost its property. You put two things together, when it becomes water, it does not become hydrogen or oxygen. But you put my uh, phone and my mouse you can make a physical mixture of two, I can separate it out. But anybody else can answer this question. Yes, I think uh, there are some people who are also experts of the field and uh, Mrs. Uh, Vijaya Vatilingam is one of them. And uh, I think a couple of episodes ago, Vijaya Ma'am was a guest in this uh, forum. And uh, she took up this topic and explained uh, very nicely. Vijay ma'am, if you would like to uh, give the answer. Let me take the other question. <laughs> and uh, as sir mentioned, as sir replied, that is uh, something, a very new thing. We generally talk about that integration is you are uh, making a separate group and you are integrating them to the... Uh, mainstream setup with when we talk about education and inclusion is in the same classroom everybody is sitting together and enjoying whatever activities they are supposed to do so generally we explain uh, integration and inclusion in this way but what sir said that uh, that is completely it's an exceptional way of explaining sir i must say thank you if it would make sense good of course, because sir. I, I know physics, so I can talk only physics. <laughs> <laughs> sir, one more question. Uh, yeah. How can we as teachers identify the potential of a particular child 
in a classroom of 40 students as you were talking about the optimization of potential. I think that's why uh, Ms. Patel has written Which this. Which kind question. of school is it? I'm sure um, she is, must be from a mainstream school. So 40 students when she is talking about since uh, I mean one of the good schools. Uh, one one of the good schools, yeah, of right. course. The first important point is our biggest obstruction to learning is teaching. If we stop teaching, students will learn much faster, then that will create more space. And good school can always use online tests are today available. For example, if you ask all of your students to create a psychological profile, let us say a simple thing like multiple intelligence test. Now, it creates a profile for the student and you can figure out, I mean, when I was doing this, I normally first try out myself. Just as uh, Monovina is a good cook, so she first take the test of it, then gives it to Aru. So I tried out on myself and I found that my musical intelligence was higher than my <laughs> verbal and mathematical intelligence, which I always thought that will be my gist. Now, for example, if this test is taken and I've tried out with schools, so it is nothing new. I took the students to the class, it takes just 10 minutes. They sat down on the computer terminal, they opened the uh, online test. There's a, uh, I mean, Goldman himself has a test on Martin. Howard Gardner himself has a test. So when you take that one, similarly, for example, those who are the mothers, remember, there is no better option than a mother. A mother watches much more the child's tendencies. There's a beautiful book called Tactics by Edward de Bono, Art and Science, Science and Art and Science of Success. 50 top world performers are interviewed. They are source of inspiration. Unfortunately, nobody talked about the father, mother. And none of the mother is known as a performer, that group. But that mother's affectionate insistence is much more powerful in inspirer than father's insistent exactitude. If the schools want to do, schools are right now wasting a lot of time unnecessary talking, considering it to be teaching. I was sharing with Monobina, I'll share with you. I'm working with three schools, about 300 teachers, and the school about 200 teachers. One day, I'm basically teaching them how to do self-regulated learning using blended learning model mode. One day, one teacher told me from Bangalore, he said, sir, I'm feeling very bad that I'm not working and taking salary. I said, what's the problem? He said, sir, students are learning themselves. I said, are they learning better? He said, yes, sir. Are the parents happy? Yes, sir. I said, then what is your problem? He said, but I am not teaching. I said, tell it properly that you are not talking. <laughs> Why don't you understand? Because you have stopped talking, they have started learning. He said, then what should I do? So there's a beautiful concept for servant leadership. I said, can you become servant to your students? See what do they need and immediately help them get that one. So 40 students in your classroom, but they are 40 individuals and schools should have a mechanism to develop that kind of a thing. And that is exactly where the individualization becomes difficult in classroom teaching. But more you take to group preparation. So for 40 students, the moment you make them group learning, it becomes eight only. Now eight is easy for you to see, but certainly not 40. And by any evidence, research evidence, I recently published my book on education technology. I did almost 800 references. No contradiction at all. When children learn in groups, they learn much better. Sure. Mentored and moderated by teacher, but not controlled by teacher. Here are the clarification. The school Sir. has to focus on that. Oh, yeah. Uh, one more question. Uh, could you please suggest some solutions to the problem of exclusion of differently able children from mainstream schools? Well, I don't have solution. I know what the mainstream schools did. They created another section after two o'clock, brought yeah. old government school, government school retired teachers and government school retired uh, 
teachers and headmaster and ran parallel see madam problem is it's a case of mindset if you watch carefully and i watch it at my home it becomes passion for some people and for some other people it becomes a burden is a question is there is no mechanical solution about it you must have noticed there are many sympathizers of children with certain disabilities go back to their background will find they have somebody at home the son or the daughter or somebody at home so that easy for them it is easy to empathize now the question is not in there's no mechanical solution question is developing the empathy developing the passion I mean, mechanical solution we have tried is not work. Yes, sir. Is there any nationwide policy of inclusion that is not on papers but in practice? This is a very difficult question. <laughs> not on papers but in practice. Very intelligent question, I must say. <laughs> yeah, in fact, in practice, there are much more than policy and policy and practice is not really different 100 practices makes a policy because that is where we derive if you find many of the people who have let us say an autistic child they do practice how to develop uh, how to help him or her to learn and we have seen this practice but that is home based practice Yes. Uh, there is one more. Uh, Professor Mukhopadhyay, Professor Mrs. Mukhopadhyay has written this. Yeah, you can help explain with help of your hand. Yeah, I mean the normal concept is you can make a fist and all that. I say it differently that with this eyes type at a speed of hundred. Whereas with all the fingers intact, monovina types at a speed of only 30. <laughs> yes. Because, because I talk on this one, it makes a file. <laughs> so one more question is from Mrs. Kavita Sharma. Um, so you have been in this field of education for many years and uh, or many hats. Why is it that funding for education is low? compared to other fields and why it can't be managed by the central government? Well, this, this is a very comfortable question for me. It has two sides, uh, Madam Sarma. One is shortage of fund when you say 3.8% of GDP. Once I remember, I was discussing with uh, Dr. Mulimuna Joshi, who was then the education minister. He said, Marwar, we have make it 6%. I said, no, sir, you have not make it. No, no. 3.8% and 2.4% is the private. I said, we have never asked for private expenditure. We have talked about 6% public expenditure. But the other side of the story is very serious. Whatever money is given, education sector has not learned how to utilize it. I have myself been involved in many of the uh, project evaluation. For example, education technology scheme, I was commissioned to evaluate. They have not been able to utilize it. And there are many cases where utilization is poor. It's just there. For example, there was a study on uh, class, computer literacy. 15% of the objectives are achieved. In my case, one of the state got the money for education technology scheme. They diverted it to salary of the panchayat workers. So it has two sides of the story. One is, yes, it is a poor funding. And also they are, if you are seriously interested, I remember once I was in the planning commission's working committee. You see, higher education gets the big share because it's of high priority for politics. Primary education gets another big share because it is also part of politics. Secondary education gets the secondary treatment. It has the least return to politics, so least investment in education. For example, today if you see Government of India is talking about 50% GER in higher education. GER is an irrelevant concept of higher education. It's good for primary education. Higher education you can enter only when you have completed your higher secondary education. So right concept is 
trans i mean uh, transition to higher education but the problem very seriously and also for example if you watch carefully the statements of the politicians at the moment they don't think education is necessary to give you an example there is many people talk about why no indian university figures in the top 100 i wrote to sri pranam mukherjee when he was president do you know what does it cost to make a top university in the world i spent little bit of time in university of illinois in usa so they wanted a professor with a nobel laureate in science you know the professor's bargaining i opened up for me he said yes yes i'll be very happy to come to illinois but i'll have to bring entire staff and my laboratory and university of illinois agreed would we do, do it our kurana will not get a job because he is not qualified so when he goes there he gets the nobel laureate now the problem is very very serious it is not amount of fund only government in fact in the recent years it has further gone down the other day i was talking to iim they are saying they have been asked to find their own funds to become self sufficient self reliant which means they will have to charge very high amount of money if they charge very am- high amount of money who will be able to pay so monobina's inclusion will get a toss it will be absolutely exclusive not intelligent not well read but heavily money powered but that's a government policy uh so mrs vijaya vetilingam has written this uh, regarding i think uh, integration and inclusion okay well yes. i can appreciate uh, mrs vijaya prakash has been talking for um, for her expertise expert background on inclusive education the way you people understand my understanding <laughs> yes. is my understanding is integration is then when you don't realize the difference at the moment we realize the difference i remember we had a student at that time i had no idea about these things in illinois she was not able to hold her head but i did not find anybody sympathizing she is given all the facility that we are getting except that she cannot hold her head it is very difficult to identify how is she different from us sure. that's really integration when your identity is lost as i that's why i gave you the example of chemical uh, mixture mm-hmm. where your identity is lost yes sir so But i she think... has got the expertise in that area so she knows better than me Uh, so sir i think we have tried to discuss the majority of the questions posted here today and um, honestly sir you compelled us to think that the concept of inclusion is in itself exclusionary i really never thought in this way before so thank you very much sir if you bring and, non expert that is what is going to happen to you sir you are you are an expert in everything I am divergent. So, I am divergent, <laughs> so I don't converge on things. Thank Good. you very much sir, for okay. your time and uh, such a wonderful session. So, would you uh, like to give some concluding advice to our viewers? And there is one more question, sir. I think can we take okay. that? Please? Sure, sure. Professor Mukhopadhyay, why we do not have separate help desk in government agencies? affiliating boards and mainstream schools state education for parents of differently able children bridge bharadwaj it seems to be known name to me bridge are you the same person he is a principal he of a school in bangladesh now bangladesh or now he is in ashram oh he cannot talk he will i think he he will write here maybe he is writing i, I think he was with me Okay. Well, first important point is when you say why don't we have separate help desk? Is it a priority for the government? 
government does what is priority for government as i told you in 1985 when this question came up they said oh, they are not even 5% i give you a small example yes i think he is the same same bridge for yeah. that so actually bridge, bridge walked with me but he didn't ask this question then good yes sir. okay <laughs> now the whole question today is that when you look at government policy government policy is guided by its own consideration you must be noticing there is a there is an organization called site savers Every day they advertise repeatedly that there are 80 lakh blind blind people in the country and 80 percent of them can be cured with 2,000 rupees if you donate. I calculated it comes to only 1,200 crores. Do you mean government of India doesn't have 1,200 crores? Is a peanut for them? Why do sight savers have to ask for it? UNICEF has been advertising for the pregnant women and the child in the rural areas. Look at the money required and look at the amount of money on which government of India is sitting. Money is not in short supply. I've been on the planning commissions, many working committees. Money is not a concern. It's not the amount of money or non-availability. It's the priority. Do you know in the first five-year plan, 6% was the allocation to education. When the flood came, it required money. So they immediately found education the softest. So the money was diverted from education allocation to flood management. It never recovered. So don't go, I mean, as an old person participating in policy and uh, planning of the country, I can assure you, there's no shortage of money. Money is in plenty. I remember in SSA meeting, what was shared by Dr. Manmohan Singh, he was then Prime Minister, Finance Minister was there, Mr. Chidambaram, I was there as a member. They confirmed whatever money you require, it will be available. But Dr. Manmohan Singh is Dr. Manmohan Singh. With his polite, modest style, he said, but I'll need result. I tell you, we the so-called education people were second because we know how to take the money but not give the result. So I assure you, money is not a problem. Problem is priority. Yeah, priority is all that matters here. Uh, thank you very much once again, sir, for your time and support and this wonderful session. So would you like to give some uh, concluding advice to us? Sir? No, concluding advice is very simple. Don't get into conventional thinking. Question everything on earth. Discover again. And most of the time, to give you an example, our national education policy 2020 has come. Everybody says a lot of Indian, Indian, Indian. We quote Dewey. We quote Bloom. Why it has not been able to talk about Shikshabali of the Three Upanishad? It's an education treatise. We don't have the courage to question, to talk divergent ideas. <clears throat> we love people who are convergent. My submission is, if India has to grow, India must question. And that is where we develop innovative mind. If you look at some of the expressions that we use at home and at school, at home, whenever the child is different, we say, Achche bachche aise nahi karte hai. we are killing the creativity. Sure. In school, teachers say, Chubra. Why? Child's job is to, mind reacts immediately. Students are not allowed to ask questions in classrooms. Yeah. Not I all. remember I was doing a program in Tamil Nadu. Mm -hmm. So, you know, students at a time, so teachers said, no, one at a time. I say, why one at a time? I can't make out. Then I said, you go to an ENT specialist. Sir, what about discipline? I said, for that, police people are there. Teacher is not for discipline. Teacher is only to help children learn. We have a very small experimental school in my village where two things have been banned. One is teaching, another is disciplining. 
I assure you, in 10 years, there is no case of indiscipline. And government of West Bengal sent twice expert committee to see what is happening in a school where teaching is banned. And when they found they have learned much better, so director of CRT asked me, sir, how is this possible? I said, because you have stopped teaching. Teaching is the only interference to learning. So, so we are still movement, getting questions. <laughs> people's movement can change this time. Yeah, exactly. That is the only way. But as you know, right now, because Ukraine, Ukraine did not agree with Russia, so invaded with its power. So that will happen. Uh, seeing the brand during the pandemic, that's so many migrants who had to go back homes and had to no jobs as did not have education. No, they are they are Kavitaji, I'll tell you. We have certain perception about education. I was doing a very interesting survey. If I share with you, and I question Swami Vivekananda, whom I respect most in my life. I asked a question between illiterate, semi-literate, educated, highly educated, who is likely to be most corrupt? Answer was highly educated. Who is likely to be most chivalrous, illiterate? Who is likely to be most helpful or empathic, low educated? In other words, education de-characterizes a human being. I'll suggest you to, if you can find an occasion to read Jeffrey Sachs, End of Poverty. India has a lot of poor people because there are 142 billionaires. It's a simple economic theory. Monomina's loss is my profit. So unless 100 monominas lose, I can't become rich. And People's movement, yes, in fact, you have seen how Gandhiji mobilized the people and got such a big power British out of the country. But people's voice are choked because they have choked themselves because as I told you on the Muslim meeting, the Muslim leaders, they are asking about their college, not our Muslim community. And I was there personally in that meeting. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, as uh, I was mentioning earlier, we really have got plenty of food for thought uh, in today's session. And so it was the 36th episode of uh, Let's Talk Inclusion and the most unique one, I must say. Thank you very much for you your time. There are, there are experts sitting there. The, of course. Uh, very enriching <laughs> sessions. Uh, all of um, most of the sessions were very enriching, and uh, every session was very. We we learned a lot, but this one is unique because you uh, did not talk in conventional ways. So this is a unique session, I must say, and we really have got plenty of food for thought, and we will think about it. And maybe uh, would you, I would request you to come uh, once again if you have some time. Yeah, uh, Kavita ji has also written the same. We need to hear you more, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Thank you for asking me. <laughs> but I must get some more ideas to come back. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. No, I and, could not uh, avoid you because... The Monday somebody invited me. I said, Bhai, aur kisi ko bula lo. No, sir. I said, Okay, I'll be there. But they have invited. But because I always say that daughter is the boss. So my daughter, when I do any sketching, if it is good, she says, Oh, you have inherited from me. So instead of she inheriting from me, I have inherited her from her. So when Monomina asked me, I have no choice to say no. Otherwise, I'm not a fit person for this expert group here. So you are thank a fit you. person everywhere. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you very much for coming here. And all the viewers are requesting you, sir, to come once again to take out some more time. And uh, honestly, we all need to hear from you more. But let, let everybody know that it is at the cost of Ahilya. 
Oh, yes, of course. Of course, sir. And um, maybe there will be a repeat telecast time for that, sir? No, no. No, there is no repeat telecast. Doesn't okay. matter. So there, we, so there will be nothing resolved there. We will change time, sir. It means we will change time. <laughs> don't, don't have to change. So that one hour or one and a half hour, we can uh, go on. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. And okay. uh, to our viewers, thanks very much for your active participation in today's session. See you soon on the 37th, 37th episode of Let's Talk Inclusion, maybe next week or the week after. Till then, take care and goodbye. Thank you very much. Right, sir. Thank you. Once again, thank you.